ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for making it back into the auditorium. If you're still uh, coming in, do so as efficiently, quickly, and quietly as you can, because uh, we're going to launch our next panel debate right now. And I'm delighted to say this one is truly a, an international debate, and we're bringing together people from all different regions of the high north, so the Arctic represented from different communities and different countries, just as it should be, uh, particularly given the subject of this debate, which is all about Arctic societies and the resilience of Arctic societies. And some of the debate, when we were talking <coughs> just a little earlier about the relationship between science and politics and decision-making, you know, we came down to a discussion about where does the power lie, whose voices are listened to, whose voices determine what action is taken. Uh, and that is going to be very relevant, I think, to this debate too about the resilience of Arctic societies. To what extent are Arctic societies shaping their own futures? And to what extent are they finding that their futures are being shaped for them by people from outside their communities and societies. So there's some big questions to address in this. We're not going to do this by way of um, keynotes and then discussion. We're just going to go straight into it. We're just going to go for it with the discussion from the very beginning. So what I'm going to do is um, call up to the stage all of my guest participants and don't give them a clap for each one, because that would take too long. Let me tell you exactly who's going to be on the panel, and then you can give each one of them, I mean, give them collectively a big round of applause. So let me invite to the stage Anna Karin Oli, who is the State Deputy Minister of Local Government and Modernization. Welcome to you. Bert Stedman, who is a senator, a state senator from Southeast Alaska. Pierre Moreau, who is Minister of Energy and Natural Resources for the National Assembly of Quebec. Grigory Lyedkov, who is from the Russian Association of the Indigenous Peoples of the North. Carla Jessen Williamson, who is a professor at the University of Saskatchewan. And Christine Batruch, who is the vice president of Lundin. Uh, I, I know she's based in Switzerland, I think, but the Swedish company, and welcome to you. So, all of you, take a seat and give them a very warm round of applause. And I, I should say uh, that we, we, we're going to do one of our usual things. We're going to switch a couple of panel members at halfway. But throughout this, we're going to have, again, the roving microphones. And after a few questions from me, much better questions, as always, from you. So uh, do listen carefully and decide what you want to ask, because you'll get your opportunity. Uh, so let's kick off um, with this idea that I just put out there about when we're talking about the resilience of Arctic societies, right now, today, 2018, in the Arctic, from your various perspectives, different places, different communities, would you say that your communities are more in charge of their destinies than ever before, or still their destinies are very much being shaped by outside forces over which they have very little control? So I want a perspective from each of you on... on that. Uh, and let me start because I'm interested to get perspectives from, from far away from Roy. Actually, I'll start with Bert Stedman and, and we'll start in Alaska and then we'll go around the geography. Well, that's a pretty easy one. You know, as the, as the globe has uh, industrialized and, and gone to the hydrocarbon uh, uh, marketplace, it is pushing the Arctic. So they're not in control. Uh, currently, today, we have uh, China. That's going through a huge expansion. It looks like India's going to follow next. I don't think they'll be in control of their own destiny for quite some time. Totally. But we can work together, um, particularly at the local level, uh, to try to modify and, and work through this as we develop uh, cash economies and we work to continue to hang on to the historic lifestyle, including subsistence hunting and fishing. And also, we got to uh, remember we need to bring their um, standard of living up with everybody else in the world, not leave them behind, uh, thinking pity on the poor people in the Arctic. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess the opposite for 
these purposes, well, roughly the opposite of resilience would be vulnerability. So are you saying that from where you sit in, in Alaska, the, the Arctic communities that you serve appear to you to be more vulnerable than ever before? No doubt about it. As the ice has retreated and, uh, and the globe is warmed, um, from, a, uh, from that standpoint, they are more, vul more vulnerable. From the flip side of that, though, uh, it gives them the opportunity as the, in, as the area is developed to slowly move into a cash economy and to increase their standard of living. Mm. So it's not a, a one-sided uh, one sword at all. All right. Well, that, that, that's a fairly bleak way to start, but maybe the word is realistic. I don't know. Let, let's hear from Norway. We've got, got our Deputy Minister of Local Government and Modernization here, Anna-Karin Olli. So, Anna-Karin... Uh, would you share the feelings that you've heard from Alaska? Yes, um, you know, most of you are, are, um, uh, are uh, coming from south. I've, when I come here to, to Shumti South, because I'm, uh, I'm born and raised in the Arctic, so I'm uh, normally uh, coming from, from the north. Right, so Where, where's your home? Uh, I'm, uh, I've been mayor in the Mose uh, municipality, mm. um, so I'm born and raised and, uh, here, and um, the people have lived here for hundreds of years, uh, and um, also the Sami people, I'm Sami myself. Um, and uh, to, to your question, I think the most, most important is the people who live living here. They are li lives, as I said, they have been here for hundreds of years, and, um, and they know how the know the Arctic and know how, um, how to live here. They, uh, they, uh, they're used to the rough weather conditions. And I think, um, I think um, the most important is the people who's living here. So, so um, uh, and... Uh, but ha how much control do they have over the key decisions that will determine their future? I mean, Bert's yes. already pointed to the big picture of uh, global patterns mm. in, in trade and in yes. you know, carbon production, and all, which have a huge impact, mm. but also just on national levels. You know, in Norway, for example, you know, how much role do the northern communities really have in shaping their futures in terms of future decisions on uh, resource exploration, infrastructure development? You know, are they truly part of the decision-making process, or do decisions happen to them, yes. taken elsewhere? In Norway, we have we had this Arctic strategy <coughs> in many years. And uh, now, last year, we released uh, a new Arctic strategy where the domestic policy is more uh, highlighted than before. And um, you have also um, uh, the, uh, a new re regional forum where, where the, of course, the, the national government, but also the northern counties uh, and the Sami parliament are participants. So, so it's, um, it's, I think... But are they tokenistic or are they real in terms of their influence and power? Yes, I think more and more, but we have to, uh, we have to, um, uh, how to say, quite the utvikle, develop yeah. th this, this, uh, this forum uh, further. Yeah, mm. all right, well, thank you. Let, let's get, continue our geographical spread. Uh, Grigory, you, you speak for the indigenous peoples of the north in Russia, so I'd like your from Quebec. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> looking at, I'm looking at the wrong man. <laughs> Let me zero in on you, Grigory, so <laughs> we'll get to Quebec in a minute. Uh, Grigory, you, you give us your perspective on this discussion about the ability of indigenous peoples and uh, northern communities to control their own destiny. And by the way, everybody, Grigory is going to speak in Russian, so put your headsets on if you don't speak, and like me, don't speak Russian. Good afternoon, dear friends, uh, friend, uh, citizens of the Arctic, friends, guests. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank for the opportunity to speak at this prestigious uh, international forum. And uh, in touching upon the subject that we're discussing today, I'd like to, to put it like this. I am a Nenets. My, me and my people are Arctic reindeer herders, and we live and we take the, the Arctic is so big 
So about half of the Arctic is uh, inhabited by uh, uh, Arctic nomads. And yesterday, we discussed the issues of uh, scientific cooperation and already said that and repeated that when a geologist, uh, scientist, uh, a military person meet, uh, when they come to the Arctic, they get ready to be in extreme condition. They have to have a proper morale. Uh, they have to know how to find their way in, in the Arctic. Uh, they have to be stress resistant. And we've been living in this environment for hundreds uh, of years and millennia, and our survival skills are so fine that for us it's a favorable environment. And the basis of our life is our is the uh, many centuries of our knowledge. The, uh, it help they help us uh, raise our children, feed ourselves, and also. Uh, and the centuries that we've been living in this area, we've. Uh, uh, our existence proves that we are together with the reindeer, and we tell our government today that uh, we have reindeer not just uh, for, uh, for pleasure. Even in the 21st century, this is still our uh, agricultural activity. It gives employment. It, uh, we pay taxes. We pay people wages. But and it also, these lands are not abandoned. There is not a single kilometer of land that uh, we could say it's no one's, because it's uh, our family sacred lands where we worship our gods, where we have our uh, graves, and we, where we have our seasonal pastures. So for us, it's a favorable environment. And if we talk about uh, sustainability or resilience, our life shows that this is our home, and we will always, we will always be living there. And if we talk. So if we talk about how we influence the situation, of course, life changes. And we, in Russia, we think that today we have an opportunity to work in parliament, uh, because I'm a member of the uh, national parliament of the State Duma, and I represent the Arctic region. And I work in the ethnic uh, committee of the Duma. And there are various initiatives uh, to uh, uh, amend national legislation. And, and if we see academia or industry promoting laws that will have a negative impact on our life, uh, we have real tools uh, through parliament to stop those initiatives right at, uh, in the parliament of Russia. And we're also happy to have the opportunity to work within the Arctic Council uh, on par with all other states and gives us a lot of possibilities. And then it's all down to us how able we are to teach our youth to learn these arguments and uh, uh, sustain our interest in the future as well. It's very interesting you put it that way, that uh, you, know, you say we have political mechanisms which allow us to have our interests represented in the State Duma and in the, in the policy planning of the central government. But that phrase of yours, that then it's down to us, is interesting because, you know, I, I'm not experienced in the, all of the issues of Arctic communities, but I have traveled in Alaska and in Greenland and northern Canada, and I have seen that there are real issues in um, indigenous communities, issues connected sometimes with, with uh, obviously with poverty, but also with abuse of, of alcohol and drugs and uh, alienation, a sense of alienation and neglect, which feeds then into behaviors which are not sort of self-helping, and, and indigenous peoples are trying to address this. In, in Russia, when you say that about we need to do things for ourselves and help ourselves, would you say that your indigenous peoples of the north are fulfilling their own potential and, you know, maximizing what they can do and achieve in their communities. Yes, it's a very good parallel. I would say our association uh, shortened RAIPON, uh, indigenous peoples uh, of uh, the Siberian North and Far East. You see, uh, north of Siberia and Far East. It's 11 time zones, a huge territory, and we live in 28 regions of Russia. It's two-thirds of the Russian territory, and these 42 peoples are very much different. 
for example, the Sami people are close to the Nordic countries in culture, but people in Altai are uh, relative to China. Our Nanais uh, or the, the Gates, etc., in Far East, and uh, their relatives are in the neighboring China, Japan. Uh, they have very similar cultures, and of course, uh, radically different uh, are their life conditions and cultures and the economic activities. But generally speaking about those peoples collectively in Russia, we know for sure that people where they maintain their traditional livelihoods and traditions, they are much more resilient to all external impacts, economic, uh, social conditions, and where people like their ancestors are in taiga or mountains or tundra, and they are herding yaks or, or reindeer or uh, horses, or they live off uh, land hunting and fishing. They maintain their traditions. We have sad experience when during the Soviet time there were national programs when the, nation, uh, the government was taking care of people. Uh, creating them villages and providing them urban conditions. We have had this sad experience in Ninets and Chukcha Autonomous Okrugs. I come from Ninets Autonomous Okrug, and all my relatives had to uh, uh, denominate uh, when the government uh, subsidized this uh, a drift from a nomadic way of life. And back in 1990s, like the whole of Russia, people uh, experienced very harsh economic conditions. And today, for these 25 or 26 years, our association has been working to bring people back to their sources. And for example, in Nenets Autonomous Okrug, people are owing their own reindeer, and they have recovered the uh, stocks up to 12,000 uh, reindeer. And th thank you for that. Um, what 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 we're learning from that experience is that in in Russia, where the government you know made efforts in certain cases to sort of change lifestyles and intervene in a massive way under perhaps the label of a modernization, uh, it had some very negative effects on the resilience of local communities. So we've got a, 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 a Canada grouping sort of here, and, and I, I as I said, I have spent a little bit of time in the indigenous communities uh, in, in one small part of Canada. Uh, Justin Trudeau came to power saying, you know, we've made some terrible mistakes, and I think he actually issued a formal apology for things the Canadian government has done in the past toward indigenous peoples in, in the north. Uh, how are you going to make things better in Canada, Pierre? Well, as far as Quebec is concerned, we're working very closely with the uh, Northern community. In, in Quebec, it's, it's quite special because what we call Northern Quebec is uh, above the 49th parallel, but it's very, very cold. It's, it's much colder than, than here in, in Tromso. It's a, a few, few weeks ago, I went to Mexico, and the day of my departure, it was with the windshield factor, it was minus 38 degrees, so it's, it's very uh, chilly up there. But, uh, and, and it's a fairly large area. It's, uh, I, I said that it's, uh, this, it's the combined area of Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Denmark, and it's just a third of the <laughs> Quebec territory. And, and, and there are very few people up there. It's, uh, there are 120,000 person, one third Aboriginal, one third Inuit, and one third people from the south that that, that move to, uh, to to the north, and the Cree community, the Aboriginal community, and the White are working uh, closely together. The Inuits are combined in fourteen villages around northern Quebec, and they're much more isolated. And and what you what you say and what you see in in northern Canada, like poverty or and and, and having difficulty to cope with modern life is uh, much more, you, you can witness it in the, in the uh, Inuit community more than in the Cree because they're very much integrated to what we're doing in Quebec. And northern Quebec, uh, you have huge uh, dam that produce electricity there and, and huge workplace. And, and we combine the uh, people from the south and, and from the uh, Aboriginal community that works together in, in those workplace, work sites. 
But it's very different as far as the 14 villages are concerned. They're very isolated. Mm. You only travel there by plane, by boat during summertime. I think that there's two boats uh, traveling to uh, those northern community, and most of, of uh, the goods and, 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 and individuals travel there during winter time by snowmobiles. So they're very isolated. And even though the uh, electric power come from the north for all the territory of Quebec, those 14 villages uh, use fossil fuels to, uh, to produce mm -hmm. energy. And we're working very hard to get them out of the fossil fuels because of the fragility of the ecosystem up there. And uh, we have a pilot project going on uh, to produce energy with uh, solar panel, but uh, just like here, sometimes there's no sun. Uh, so we're experiencing a, com a combination of solar panel and windmills uh, to produce energy. So I, I want to ask Carla wh whether you feel, Carla, that the government, whether it be at, at state or, or national level in Canada, it, it has a, a policy that enhances the resilience of these communities that Pierre's just talked about. Yeah, resilience is a funny word to, uh, to actually use mm. uh, in form of the uh, lives of the Arctic because uh, in many ways that's been used as a universal t term that denotes to that everybody goes through the same thing in form of uh, how you bounce back from uh, experiences, bad experiences and whatnot. In the case of the uh, Arctic peoples, uh, as far as resilience is concerned, it is, of course, coming from the energy that we have from within, mm. uh, where we are in many ways very spiritual that uh, um, our neighbor over there from Russia talks about. Did you uh, really identify with his words, where he essentially said, you know, it, it's by fostering our um, heritage and our culture and our traditional way of life much more than sort of being modernized that we we stay strong and resilient and uh, you know fit as a, as a community and a society i would say that uh, the uh, arctic peoples themselves feel very very honored to be born in the arctic each one of us are uh, from that point of view very privileged that way but where the hardship comes about is the colonial structures that have been, uh, that have been uh, implanted in the north, uh, whereby the uh, governance structures from the south are implanted right directly into the tundra, literally, and uh, done in a way that the colonial system perpetuates itself, reborn in the north. <laughs> and uh, despite the um, uh, incredible uh, amount of work that has been done in uh, getting these governance structures to the Arctic, they remain to be very much operating from the point of view of the colonial systems from the south. So you would see that in the uh, Arctic Canada, as you would see that in, in uh, Greenland as well. There's a lot of uh, despondence in that regard, where, as you were saying, problems that exist in, in form of uh, abuses of various kinds. But uh, how to bounce back on this one here is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the participation of the nation states that have uh, actually colonized the Arctic really have huge responsibilities to respond to this problem in a way that they look at themselves inwards to see what kinds of changes that can be made within the station mm. na uh, na uh, stations, I mean, nation states, as to uh, changes that can be made. These nation states are run by the uh, male privilege. They are run by ideas of race, of who they are and what they are. They are run by a knowledge system that does Which not goes necessarily... goes back to our earlier debate. Yes, yeah. does not necessarily stem from, uh, from the north. So we need to really make sure that the uh, nation states actually address their own problems in form of racism, in form of imperialism, <laughs> in form of colonization and actually see the Arctic peoples to be real people. Uh, are that's where, that, that's that where the rest of the, the panel uh, yeah. identify? I mean, when, when, when Carla uses words like racism, colonialism, imperialism, do you sort of hold your hands up and say, yeah, I, I know what you mean, or do you think to yourself, oh God, you know, those words are so tired and outdated and it's not fair? Well, in, in Quebec, we have the Northern Plan, the, the, the Plan Nord, what we call the Plan Nord, and it's working with those community because the Inuit have their regional uh, government system and, and we're working with them for as far as housing is concerned. There's 
huge problem of, of housing and overpopulated uh, little house. But uh, and, and the federal government had a, has a lot to do. We're trying to do our best uh, with, with, with our own jurisdiction, but, but the federal government has to be involved more and more in housing, and, he, uh, and right. Justin Trudeau just recognized that. But, but we're working with them, and we're trying to work with their regional government, and it's the same thing. Since it's one-third, 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 the national government of Quebec work with the, with the white people, but, but for the Inuit, they have their regional government, which we have linked together, mm. and we, we take decision with them. And we have a share regional government for the Aboriginal for that territory. So no colonialism in Canada? Is that no, but, but not, in, not in Quebec. We're trying to work uh, very closely uh, with them. All right. Well, I, I, I do want to bring in Christine, because Christine, so far we've had the conversation which has been sort of about government policy with relation to the northern communities and how northern communities relate to governance issues. You represent business on this panel. so. To what extent is economic imperialism happening? You know, give us your business perspective. Well, <clears throat> we feel very privileged to work in Norway because the starting point in Norway in terms of uh, oil extraction and production from a legal perspective, it's done on behalf of the people. Resources belong to the people. So companies are entrusted actually to develop the resource, but it is meant for the people. And we all know about the Global Fund, which is you know the biggest fund in the world. That is the result of um, having the notion that it's not done for business, but for society as a whole. As part of this uh, legal framework, there's also a process of consultation that goes on very early on in the process. From an environmental and social point of view, when it, uh, there's a decision in, in, in the parliament and the government that you may open an area for oil exploration and production, there's actually a mapping, environmental baseline studies, impact assessment and social impact assessment, and then it's brought in for consultation. So you have the opportunity, the people of the region, the specific region where the activity is going to take place, you have that process of consultation. And then every step of the way of our activities, you have a process of formal consultation. Well, I, I get the consultation, but where does the wealth end up? Yeah. Well, actually the wealth ends up in the global fund. Uh, this is where the wealth of, uh, of the oil resource end up, and as we've heard from so the minister... So, in a sense, you know, if, I, if I'm in a community in the north, which is subject to, you know, new resource development, I'm thinking, you know, I, I want a greater share. I, I'm the one bearing the burden. I'm the one whose land, historical land, is being dug up. It's my resource in many, many ways, and yet, ultimately the nation is taking it and frankly 90% of the nation doesn't live well, where there, I live. There are a couple of aspects and thanks for raising that. First, uh, activities are offshore so the footprint whether carbon or actual physical footprint is fairly minimal on the land so we don't have the issues of having to take a, away land from the people. But there are certain things that happen, and this is also expected in the Norwegian way of doing business. It's called the ripple effects. When you go into an area that you're going to develop, and it's offshore, you have to demonstrate what are the ripple effects on the local economy. And we've done studies, we've been active since 2007, and we've done studies in terms of you know, how much local procurement can we, uh, can we make, how many jobs are we going to create, mm. what are the ripple effects, for example, from a hospitality point of view, logistics, basis. We map out early on, 2007, we're not even close, we've made discoveries, but we're not even close to develop those fields. We've already made the studies to see uh, who, who are the local suppliers, do they have the relevant competence And the communities are backing this? you, are they? They're, or are well, they suggesting that your targets aren't really good enough from their point of view? Interestingly, and I've had a few conversations even this conf uh, in this conference with Sami people, again, because the physical footprint is so minimal from oil operations, they don't really have an issue, but of course they do want, they do want more jobs, and that's part of the process I, of I, yeah, Absolutely, of that's the message I get too. Yeah. But uh, I'm a rubbish timekeeper, because I, I need to squeeze in a couple of questions, and then we've got to transfer the panel a little bit, but uh, do you have a really quick point, Yes, Annika, uh, yes, uh, we have, um, you know, we have the Sami Parliament uh, yeah. uh, in Norway, and we also have these consultations uh, procedures. And, um, and when the oil, uh, oil companies, they have to uh, consultate with the, with the Sami Parliament. Mm. Uh, so, so, um, so I 
think um, um, the, the Sami people, the indigenous people of, um, in Norway also have challenges, yes, but I think they are more in the decisions making than, than uh, only a few decades ago. So okay, all right, I'm going to stop you there because I do, uh, you know, I'm sure there are people in the audience who have questions on this issue of, of local communities and the respect given and the place they have in, in uh, the decision making that in the end governs what happens in the Arctic region. So if anybody would like to raise a hand and ask a question, uh, you sir, you get the microphone. So just if you would stand up and uh, ask your question. Uh, Richard Menville, Mayor of Nome. Uh, Gregory, uh, your comments were amazing. Uh, this idea of the, uh, the, the political thing and all of them, when I think of indigenous people, and I said yesterday about listening, we have, from outside of indigenous areas, a sense of patronization, of uh, protective. Mm. And, and I think that is basically, it, it means it's well meant, but I think it's wrong. Uh, the involvement of the indigenous people is essential. Not only is it essential, it, it's, it's right. It's mm -hmm. right. And I just commend Gregory, and just as a sideline, I invited the Sami convention to come to Nome uh, in 2021, because that voice is so important, and the reindeer too. It was more of a comment than a question, but uh, do you feel totally left out as things move now, or do you feel like you have been embraced by this process of the opening of the North? Would you like Gregory to answer that one, or? It's up to you, sir. Well, I, 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 yes, I'd, Greg. I'd love to have. I'm Greg bowing to your bowing to your uh, passion for this subject, but <laughs> but um, essentially, yeah, I, I, the idea that there for too long has been a patronising attitude from uh, national capitals, from decision-making centres toward local communities in the in the high north. Would you all accept that in one way or another? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think we realize that, and that's the reason why we want them to be more and more involved in, in, in the decision-making process. Okay, and Gregory, we, maybe we don't know so much about the decision-making process in Russia, but uh, did you identify with, with the idea that there's, you know, have your people been patronized by Moscow? <laughs> You know, before I started working in the Duma, I was uh, uh, I was managing a reindeer herding company. It's a cooperative. It's about 120 reindeer herder families and fishermen, and we had very good economic performance. And today, half of my more than half of my time, I'm in Moscow. Uh, I uh, attend plenary sessions in the Duma, and there are also a lot of meetings at uh, different ministries and agencies. Uh, there is even a, uh, uh, an ethnic council under the president of the Russian Federation, where we have in, at this council we convene uh, every six months, and we can talk to the president of the country, and we can ask direct questions. And of course, this uh, direct dialogue and the possibility to have in this uh, federal arena gives us a sense that we can influence this situation. And, and uh, the president uh, several uh, visited the Arctic area several times, and we always quote him uh, that all the uh, mineral riches of the Arctic of Russia should not should not damage the indigenous peoples of the Arctic. Today, this is a political program, and we always say that we work in different regions, and there are challenges, there are good examples, but uh, the most important thing is that the relationships between the federal government, the regional governments, and the indigenous peoples are a part of uh, state uh, national policy of Russia. Today, we're building a new state. And we've only been there for less than 30 years, so we're a new state. Uh, and this is how we work in this early stage of our statehood, new statehood. And we live in the Arctic. And you see, uh, and it's our common home. And uh, I'm, we are surprised to see how different we are. If we heard this in Russia, that in someone in Russia 
uh, said that in this region we work with white people and in, in that region we work with the indigenous people. Uh, this is an unacceptable terminology in Russia. Uh, it, it wasn't so in the USSR. We, we were born uh, neither in uh, Russia, where we live now. Of course, we have different mentalities, we have different state structures, and we can see that. And, of course, from the bottom of my heart, I would like to invite you to come to Russia. We can show you how we do this in practice. Yeah, great. Well, Arctic Frontiers would, would love to be in Russia, I'm sure. Uh, not quite sure how that's going to work, but we'll think about that. Uh, anyway, thank you, uh, Grigory. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do now. I'm just going to invite, uh, again, i do it as gracefully as I can, but I'm going to thank Christine and Carla so much for being on our panel. Uh, if, you, if you would take your seats again back in the auditorium, and I'm going to invite two more people up, if that's okay. Uh, so uh, as we thank Christine and Carla very much indeed, also give a warm hand to Julie Decker of the Anchorage Museum and Alexandra Selyaseth from the youth wing of the Labour Party here in Tromso in, in uh, this very city. So two new participants, and we thank you both for joining us. So we want to get you involved straight away. So I'll start with you, Julie. Um, the Anchorage Museum, I'd, I'd love to visit the Anchorage Museum. I, I haven't in the past, but I would like your perspective. You know, in, in essence, when we're talking about resilience of Arctic societies, we are talking about uh, respect for how they've worked over a long period of time and for ensuring that they are strong and vibrant going forward. Sometimes museums see, seem like they're sort of preserving a past which is gone. But how do you see your role and, and what the message is from your museum about the vibrancy and the future of Arctic communities? Uh, I think it's an important time and a key time for cultural institutions to play a part in the conversation and to change their colonial past. Museums are, in essence, a colonial institution as well, and it's time for museums to So that's a word you're happy to use, yeah. Yes, we need to recognize what our past is and what it's created. Um, I think it's an important time for institutions that can play a cross-sector role in bringing conversations together to look at um, the role that business and industry and policy and governance and the arts and culture play in having a conversation about our many futures. Um, museums have a, a mandate to look across cultures, to have conversations with indigenous communities, immigrant communities. The, Ar uh, the Arctic is an important place for immigration, so it's native, non-native immigrant cultures that we need to be having conversations with to look at um, what our future might look like. Um, when I think about resilient societies, I think about um, our opportunity to consolidate the knowledge that we have, that's indigenous knowledge, that's the knowledge we have to move us forward. There was an earthquake in Alaska this morning, just about an hour ago, it was an 8.5 magnitude oh earthquake, and I watched you know, what our community does, which is that we instantly reach out to each other, we contact each other, we say, are you okay, we offer our resources. You know, we're a, we're a place that knows how to get ready, that knows how to react, but more importantly, we're a place that knows how to talk about human impact and human life ways. Um, that's the culture that I celebrate in Alaska, and I think we need a more empowered narrative about the people of our place, the indigenous knowledge that we can embrace, um, and the role that we can all play in having a common conversation about our future. I, I, forgive me my ignorance, but in, in Alaska, I don't know what percentage of the population of the state would be indigenous as opposed to incomers from the southern I think we're a constantly mainland. changing population. We have a strong indigenous community with strong indigenous voices. Um, it's many communities that make up Alaska, not just one indigenous community. There are um, dozens of, of communities that we need to look at, and then we're constantly changing. In terms of Anchorage, we're one of the most diverse populations in the but, United I mean, the, States. I guess the point I'm getting to is yeah. that you're a growing state. It's 14. 14 yeah. percent. Yes, yeah. roughly. So between 14 and 15 percent of the mm -hmm. 740,000 Alaskans. Right, and obviously over time, I guess that, that, that number is going to be diluted further because you have immigration into the state from the, the southern 49 or whatever you call them, I guess. Yes, the yeah. outside. So, so how are you going to safeguard the interests of the indigenous, indigenous peoples when their overall political voice, if I can put it that way, is, is being diluted? 
We watch that pretty carefully in how we structure even our organizations within the legislature, that the rural communities have a voice. Even though I'm on the rural side, we get, you know, we get outnumbered. And we also want to bring home as much of the uh, uh, decision-making capacity to the state from the federal government as we can. Uh, we're better equipped to sit down uh, with everybody in the, in the Arctic uh, and have a discussion of what's going to happen up there and when. Uh, also, there's ownership. Uh, from the native corporations of subsurface. Alaska, unlike all other states, owns the subsurface interests. Mm. And so we're different than all the rest of them. Uh, and the uh, uh, native corporations own the subsurface under their land. It's interesting. One story I covered in Alaska a while back was the pebble mine controversy, where, as I recall it, it didn't work the way you'd necessarily think, in that a lot of the pro-mine groups were actually Inuit peoples who, who could see a real benefit from this mine coming in, and the most passionate anti-mine groups were um, some of the big fishing and food, salmon canning companies, which weren't run by indigenous peoples, which were very worried about the sort of impact on Bristol Bay and the It's the, the largest red salmon run in the world. Yeah, so, so uh, do you think when you reflect on that, I, obviously some people won't be familiar with the story, but when you reflect on how that played out, would you say that indigenous voices were respected and listened to in the right way? Let me broaden the answer a little bit. I think there's a lot of concern in that area on quality of life, the ability of the communities to run a water plant, have a functioning sewer plant, have uh, groceries, maybe not on par with Seattle, but you know, um, fresher vegetables, uh, things like that. And you can't do that without a cash economy. And you get into the, and it's not much different from the oil and gas industry. Then you get into that balance. How are you going to move an area uh, into a cash economy? Uh, and you have to be very uh, sensitive to the historical uh, citizens of the area. Uh, not only the ones that have been there for 10,000 years, but the ones that have been there for 100 years. Mm. They have very, very similar uh, attitudes and positions. So uh, sometimes I think in these conversations we get too far away from uh, the family, the husband and wife trying to educate their kids, feed their kids, keep them warm in the winter, you know, turn on the electric lights. You've got to have fuel. You've got to have an electrical generation plant. You've got to have um, you got to have some cash coming in. Well, except I mean, the response might be indigenous communities managed to live good lives long before they could switch the electric on and you know have central heating. Uh, it you, depends what kind of life you want to lead, doesn't it? I think that's what it conveys is that these are not black and, black and white issues in northern communities. These are complex issues. The corporate voices may not be the voice of every part of those communities. Um, what I think we see with Pebble Mine and other um, actions in Alaska that are current again um, is that there's a new youth activism, which is why I'm excited to see Alexandra on this panel. Um, I think the vo indigenous, uh, youth indigenous voices are going to be some of our most important voices going forward to determine right. um, what our north looks like. Well, if I may say so, that's a beautiful cue to bring <laughs> Alexandra into the conversation. You're here in Tromso, and you're obviously a northerner, you're an Arctic citizen, but do you feel that makes, do you feel different from special, uh, well, special's a weird word, but do you feel that there's very much a sense in you of an Arctic identity which is different from Norwegians who don't live in the Arctic? Well, I think first and foremost, I'm like half Russian and half Norwegian, so I'm like double Arctic. <laughs> <laughs> I have this double Arctic feeling inside me. And of course, here in Northern Norway, we like, we love to <laughs> talk badly about Oslo and talk badly about so the sort of Norway. But I think that Norway also has a sense of collectivity. And I think for us being able to be a resilient society in the future, we have to focus on four vocal points. Mm -hmm. And I think education, work, infrastructure, and culture are the main points we should focus on in the future. With education, we must depend on being, or, and being to able to give our young people good education, high quality education and relevant education for our youth. And I think another important point is that maybe the most important is being able to send our youth 
out of the country and out of our borders and learn the new things so they can come back. The mm. key point is to get people to come back and mm -hmm. be resources mm -hmm. in our work life, which again leads us over to work. That's because okay. here in Norway, especially in many of the uh, like fishermen and oil industry, we have a lot of <laughs> male domination. Mm. And I think it's really important to focus on the fact that women should be included in the work life because we have a pretty divided work life, especially in these in these cultures, and I think it's important because we have so many well-educated women uh, that should be able to live and work uh, here in the Arctic, and I think that's a very important thing to focus on in the future. And the third thing uh, is the <laughs> infrastructure, <laughs> and I think that uh, we know <laughs> my generation, the millennials, we're kind of spoiled uh, because we like to go out or I like to go out and hiking in the mountains and take pretty pictures on my phone, mm. and then I want to come back and post these pictures on Instagram and Facebook and get likes from my friends from all over the world. Mm. And this is something that I expect to be able to do with our infrastructure. And I think the infrastructure is essential to remember that we need to focus on the technological infrastructure because that will be very important in the work life and in the education of the young people in the future in the Arctic. And the last point is culture. My family is <laughs> from Russia and from Norway. Uh, I have been dancing classical ballet for 12 years, and I have been living in Norway and Russia, and I'm really into politics now. My little brother, he likes to swim, and he plays the piano, and my mom just spent the last week going to the film festival here in Tromsø, watching 12 films in one week, and my dad really loves going to these kind of conferences, and all of this we actually can do in Tromsø, and I think that's so exciting. That yeah. and In the Arctic societies, in the cold societies, it's so important to have a warm heart that beats for the culture, and I think it's really important to highlight these things in our society because the culture is uh, maybe our like ambassadors that come from the whole world into Tromsø and into the Arctic societies and tell us about the rest of the world and then they can go out again and tell the world about us. And I think all of these four points are really important to, like you talked about earlier, with taking control of our areas and taking mm. control of our Arctic and how we want to make it for the future and for the youth in the future. Well, all I can say is I hope the mayor of Tromsø here isn't going to sign you up to a, a really... Okay. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, you need to sign Alexandra up to, to a big role in the, in the city development program. Um, and that's what Arctic uh, policy is about. So <laughs> but, but you know what? Uh, be honest with me. When you talk to your... I don't, do you mind me asking? I know you should never ask a woman this, but how old are you? 17. Roughly. How much? 17. 17, oh my God, you're so young. <laughs> when, you talk, when you talk to your friends who are, I guess, finishing high school, contemplating university, how many of them, in all honesty, can see making their lives, their futures, economic, social, cultural futures in Tromsø, the north, or how many of them really expect, you know, in the course of their life to leave and go someplace else? I think that, like I said before, it's like, most of my friends are really focused on getting out at some point and getting out to see the world. And I think that's very important. And I think it's important that our government and our school system makes that possible to go and exchange, to go and study abroad mm. or in Oslo and like if you want to do that. But to get a bit out, I think that's so important to get. But then your message would be make sure there's enough to bring them back. Yeah, I think that's the key point of it, to get people back. And I. And honestly, talking to my friends and talking to people my age, people imagine a lifestyle and living in the Arctic. They imagine coming back because it's a great place to live. Mm -hmm. We have so many good things here mm -hmm. in Tromsø and here in the Arctic. And I think it's important to highlight that and highlight it to young people. So mm -hmm. they just don't only want to leave, they yeah. actually want to come back as well. No, I, it's a great point. I mean, I sometimes wonder, because Tromsø does have a lot to offer and you put it so well, I, I wonder just how representative Tromsø is of, of, you know, the Arctic North. Northern communities, I think it's, it's very different because here you have a lot of, of energy and a lot mm. of, of, of thing going on, mm. but it's quite different in up north uh, Quebec. Yeah, you talked about your... It's very difficult. Your very difficult. Inuit villages, 14 of them that are it's so a remote. Huge, such a huge territory and yeah. so, so few people there that it's very difficult. And, and it's a big challenge to, to have young people 
stay in their community, right. and, and it's, it's quite normal to want that they want to see the world. But yeah, but the issue how, is how here, Alexander is saying it's very credible to imagine that they will want to come back, exactly. whereas in some of your communities that we're discussing, they may well never want to see it, well, they might want to see it again, but yeah, they don't but want to live there again. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I'd like to go back to her, her earlier point of going to the outside, which is what we call it up where I live, and coming back to your earlier point about someone maybe wanting to live, you know, in a pre-electric... Um, yeah. You can't take the next generation and tell them they can't have an iPhone, they can't have a flat screen TV, they can't, uh, their kids can't watch uh, Bugs Bunny on TV. Uh, That's dating you, you, you by the way, Bugs that. Bunny. I don't, I, don't, <laughs> but you can't, you can't, I don't think kids are watching no, Bugs no, Bunny too much today. Right, but, but the point I'm making is you can't, you can't do that. Yeah. Society is gonna go forward, standard of livings are gonna go up. Yeah. We need to bring everybody up with us. Exactly. We're yeah. not going to pre-electric. No, fair enough. All right, I, I want to bring the audience in, but go on. And we have to, ha have to make Arctic so interesting, so, so yeah. our youth are coming back and also youth from other parts of the, the, um, the country. So, um, because, Quite. yes. Get incomers as well, not just yes. people who were born here. Okay, uh, we, we've got a little bit of time left before we end for questions. So we'll start with you over there. Yep, stand up and here's the microphone. Give us your name and a question. Hi. Um, I'm the chair of the Inuit Circle Polar Council. I just wanted to remind the moderator and the um, audience that the uh, indigenous peoples have our own governance systems, that they're not being diluted because of um, non-indigenous populations coming into our communities. Yesterday's discussion around shipping, um, oil and gas development, uh, you want to do it through our waters, which are our main highways. Uh, you want to explore and develop gas, oil and gas, in our areas, which are our food security. Uh, I'm really mad. <laughs> I'm really mad. That's why I'm shaking. Uh, just want to remind you that indigenous peoples are in the north, are in the Arctic, with our own governance systems. We depend on the environment. We depend on the um, the ocean for food sources and that um, thinking that migration of other peoples into our communities is diluting our authority and our position is colonial as, as uh, Carla was saying um, and you know just want to remind you that there needs to be more indigenous um, politicians and practitioners up there and in the Arctic yeah, frontier, yes. as I uh, very rarely put it in one of the papers. Thank mm. you. No, well, thank you for, for giving us your insight and, and speaking up. It's important. That, that is the whole point about who has the microphone and, and who, who is leading this debate, and it's important we hear your voice. Did you want to respond, uh, Anna Kai? Um, yes, I'm, I'm a I indigenous, uh, I'm a Sami myself. Mm. And my responsibility in the, in the ministry is also the indigenous Bisami people. And, uh, and um, I agree, it's, it's uh, very important for the Norwegian government to have a good dialogue. We, of course, we are, we are not always, uh, uh, the Sami parliament is not always agree with, <laughs> with, with us, but, uh, but it's very important to have a good dialogue. Yeah, uh, as long as it's meaningful, as long as yes, it's not just for the sake of the yes, and we have appearances. This, yes, and we have these consultation procedures, and, and we have to do them with good faith. Mm, uh, exactly. So, so um, I think it's, uh, it's uh, very important uh, uh, to have a good dialogue with the indigenous people. Okay. Uh, did, did you want to ask a question? Because it's going to have to be the last one, So, because uh, we're almost out of time. So uh, very quickly, we'll have one more question. Um, I don't know if the microphone hands. Can you get the microphone to the front? Oh, okay. Well, make a quick comment because then we probably ought to to end. So go on. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just it's wanted again, to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to emphasize the fact that the Arctic is a homeland for the Arctic peoples, and that's where we are born. That's where our home is, and that it's not a playground for people from the south to go up there and do some uh, research for the fun of it, or for that mm -hmm. <laughs> matter. All sorts of things that are happening in the in the far north. For us, it's a very very serious uh, thing 
to get across to anyone in the world that it is our home, it is our own homeland, and that we be respected for that. Uh, dignity is one thing that we really want to seek all across the Arctic. That's well, what we I think want. That, that's a great point, Carla, and thank you. And when we're discussing all of these issues, and we couched it in terms of resilience or vulnerability, but dignity is a really important word, and maybe it's a word we should finish on. I, I'm not actually going to turn back to the panel because we almost need to close, but before we do, you've probably noticed people handing notes to me, and it, it's something I want to share with you because it... Many of you will know, because I know you've got your smartphones with you and what have you, but earlier we, you told us about this earthquake, really big earthquake, um, I believe just offshore, was it? Mm -hmm. Anyway, the, the, for people here who have friends and family in Alaska, I should just say that the latest news is that the, the scale of this earthquake has generated a tsunami. Tsunami warnings have been issued, and it's going to hit shore quite soon, I mean, in the next few minutes. Um, so I'm sure you'd all join me in just hoping and praying that uh, the communities that are most at risk here are, are going to get through this. What are they? My phone's been vibrating in my pocket, and I didn't want to look. Yeah. It was off it. Kodiak. Off Kodiak? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah I mean, it, it apparently is going to hit, this tsunami is going to hit shore in the next, well, I got well, this. Well, they're, wa they're watching to see if it watching will. For yeah. It. Anyway, all one can say is, you know, our thoughts are with the communities there. We've enjoyed this conversation about the Arctic communities very much. I think your questions and the panel's insights have been fantastic. So take a break, ladies and gentlemen, but do thank our panel very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.